views expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. Every year, we reach out as the Chamber, as, as the Governmental Affairs Committee, to try to get um, our various representatives and legislators to come in and uh, share what's going on and uh, what they're working on and to let us know as Chamber members what is happening in government. And so we're very happy that today, Senator Ron Johnson has agreed to come in and speak with us. Um, if, by the way, you know any other legislative officials who would like to come in and speak to us, we welcome them as well. Senator Ron Johnson was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2010. He is chairman of the Senate Committee on Homeland and Governmental Affairs and is also a member of the Committees on Budget, Commerce, and Foreign Relations, where he is chairman of its European subcommittee. He resides in Oshkosh, Wisconsin with his wife Jane and three children and four grandchildren. Uh, the general idea is I'm going to welcome him up and he's going to share what um, he is doing and talk to us, especially hopefully about things that impact us as local, local uh, business uh, people. And then uh, we'll have some questions to ask afterwards. And if there's time, uh, open up the floor for questions from all of you here today. So with all that said, thank you so much for coming. I'd like to welcome Senator Johnson. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Josh, uh, uh, Deidre. You know, thank all of you for, for coming, giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you. Uh, but also, let me just thank you for being a member of the Chamber. Uh, I was a member of Osh Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce. Uh, just like Alexis de Tocqueville in the mid-1800s uh, noticed that really what, one of the things that really made America unique was our civic institutions. And I think that continues to this day, and, and Chambers are just a great example of that. Uh, business people, uh, members of the community coming together and, and working together for the, you know, figuring out how to, how to better their community. So again, I, I appreciate your involvement there. Um, I should warn you right up front, I'm, I'm not necessarily the most uplifting character. Uh, I, I just have this, you know, imperative to just pe tell people the truth, lay out what the reality situation is. And right now, the reality of, of, of what's happening on, on a national level is really not all that, all that good. I mean, I, I think you start with just the vast political divide in this nation. Now, I was actually heartened uh, in January. I was there at uh, President Biden's inauguration, and so much of his speech was talking about his goal of unifying and healing this nation, which I think is a very worthy goal. You know, un unfortunately, he's not doing that. Um, I, I told the Republican Party of Wisconsin Convention in May that as long as he's not doing it, why don't we adopt that as our mission statement? And, you know, the way you do that, by the way, is stop exploiting divisions and start focusing on areas of agreement. You know, you're all business people. I, I, I've said, you know, it's, it's my business person's mindset. Uh, the only way you succeed in business is focusing on areas of agreement, right? I mean, you don't go into customer and start arguing right away. You, you know, you, you focus on the fact, well, I've got a product I want to sell you. You want to buy it. Okay, so we agree on that. Now, now, we'll, now we'll start arguing over the price, right? So again, it's just that mentality, you know, quite honestly, as Chairman of Homeland Security allowed me to pass more than 130 pieces of legislation dealing with Homeland Security, because we all agreed on it. So from my standpoint, the, the primary area of agreement of just vir virtually every American is, is our overall goal, which is a safe and prosperous and secure America in Wisconsin and Sheboygan, right? I mean, isn't that what we all want? Don't we want all of our kids to grow up in safety? Uh, hopefully be taught what a great country this is so that they can utilize the tools to become pr productive citizens. I was just at uh, Winnebago Lutheran uh, High School. You know, great kids, great questions, you know, active minds. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand all the opportunities they have for them. We need to make sure that they understand what a great country this is. I think one of the most depressing things I've seen recently, there's a, there was a poll uh, a couple months ago. It's probably three, I mean, time rolls. But it, it was a nationwide poll, basically asked, you know, how much do you love this country? You know, full spectrum, you know, a lot, a little bit, not at all. Uh, the good news is no matter how they sliced and diced the polls, they do the cross tabs, they call them, every group, 
every group, except for one, had at least a majority of the people saying they loved America in some way, shape, or form. You know what the one group was? Young people. Now, I find that depressing. But, but I also find it pretty outrageous, because I know those young people weren't born into this land of plenty, into this level of affluence with a bias against this, this country. That, that lack of love for this country, that was indoctrinated into them. That's something we have to end. Because I don't care where you look around this country, I mean this world, you know, if, if you want to go to the really miserable spots, the refugee camps in Syria, what's happening in Venezuela, the, the island prison of Cuba, I mean, throughout the world, there is misery. There is, there is tyranny. There's death. There's destruction. But here in America, this is the land of unlimited opportunity. This is the land of plenty. You know, our, our generations have, have realized a level of affluence that's just unheard of in human history. How can our young people not appreciate that? Now, how wrong is that? So what we ought to be teaching our young people is, is a reverence for the genius of our founding fathers in crafting those, those marvelous documents that in one, the Declaration of Independence has what I've always said is the, the greatest mission statement written for self-governance in the history of mankind. We hold these truths to be self-evident. I just love that. It's just so obvious that all men and women are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It's, it's that vision statement that recognizes our rights are granted to us by our creator, not, not given to us by government, grudgingly. No, these are our rights. And then that government that was formed from that vision statement a, a, what's supposed to be limited government, a government designed to primarily protect our freedom, not, not to solve all our problems. As you're noticing, the government's very incapable of solving problems. Great at spending money it doesn't have, mortgaging our children's future, but not real good at problem solving. But it should primarily be here to protect us, national security, border security, protect our individual liberty and freedom so that we can take advantage of that liberty and freedom, combined with this free market system, which by the way, that, that, the, the, the description of a free market system and how beautifully it works on its own, the, the billions of individual consumer decisions, that was described also in 1776 in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. I never realized that until I started talking about these things. So in 1776, you have the Wealth of Nations describing a free market system, and same time you've got the Declaration of Independence laying out that vision statement. So it's that freedom that Americans use to dream and aspire and build and create this marvel we call America. Don't we all appreciate that? Don't we all recognize how unbelievably lucky we are? Not a perfect nation, but a nation that does strive to form a more perfect union. I mean, we really do try and do that. Now, we take some pretty odd terms and, or odd turns and, you know, from a political standpoint, you know, how do, how do we achieve that goal of safety, security, prosperity? I mean, people have all kinds of ideas from them. Some, some I would consider quite wacky. Some that are being posed on us today. But if we pull back and if we concentrate on that, that shared purpose, recognize the goodness of this nation, Emphasize that. Don't, don't emphasize the bad. Fix the bad. You know, the power of positive thinking. Emphasize the good. We certainly have a whole lot better chance of achieving that goal of safety, security, and greater prosperity. So anyway, that's kind of my viewpoint on things. I'm happy to answer any questions people have on specific issues. Always takes that first brave person. I don't bite.
Are you going to well, be asking you. questions? Well, thank you again for being here. And uh, we have a couple of questions that people asked, uh, sent in ahead of time, and so I'd like to kind of share those with you. Uh, the first question we got was, um, it's no secret the lack of workforce is putting a significant strain on employers. And here in Sheboygan County, pre-pandemic, we had more than 3,500 jobs available. And post-pandemic, we are sitting on the place of approximately 3,500 jobs still needed, and only about 518 people filing unemployment in Sheboygan County. So we have a lot more people that are needed than are looking for work right now. Um, with that background, um, what are you doing or hoping to do to remove barriers and create a realistic path to immigration for people who are willing and able to work in our communities? Yeah. Well, before I answer specifically that question, I do want to thank uh, the folks here in Sheboygan that worked with Pastor Jerome Smith and the Joseph Project. I mean, this was really, it was the Sheboygan Area Economic Development Corporation, whatever you, you call your, I mean, it's something like that, right? But that, uh, you know, we knew had, 3,500 job openings, and yet you had all this high levels of unemployment in Milwaukee. And, and I kept talking about how do you make that connection? And it really was, you know, Sheboygan connecting with Pastor Jerome Smith and uh, getting those job opportunities. You know, we, you know, make, provide transportation up here after people go through just a four day course. It's four day courses, th three days, three hours a day, where the Joseph Project participants, we just instill. The, the necessity of the commitment to succeed as well as an attitude, provide them job op, uh, interviews, then they get jobs, it transforms their lives, and that all started here in, in Sheboygan. Uh, what is such a tragedy about what President Biden did on his first and second day in office where he just ripped up, dismantled all the successful uh, policies of, of the Trump administration regarding securing our border has really put us a long ways back in terms of solving the immigration issue. Uh, you will not be able to solve the, the DACA issue. You won't be able to establish a, a functioning legal immigration system, which I'm all for. Just check out my uh, op-ed that ran in the Wall Street Journal, I think on Monday or Tuesday this week, where I'm talking about this is probably in, in, in an environment of stagflation, which is what we're in right now. You know, as, as bad as inflation is, I'm, I'm more concerned about the long-term lack of a labor force to provide the economic growth we need. Uh, a big component of that solution is a legal immigration system. But an illegal immigration system, you know, people exploiting our laws, living in the shadows, uh, depressing American wages is the wrong way to go and it's out of control right now. So again, with such a tragedy as we were so close. Uh, because of the Remain in Mexico policy, because of agreements President Trump had negotiated with Me Mexico and Central America, we'd pretty well stop the flow of unaccompanied children exploiting our laws, uh, family units exploiting our asylum laws. Uh, we were in the process of building a fence, which works. Um, but all that, all those policies were dismantled. They stopped building the fence, and now we had a record number of people uh, encountering uh, Border Patrol last year. It's averaging over 6,500 people per day being encountered, and that doesn't count the known and unknown gotaways as well. So my guess is we're probably up to about 1.2 million people, about half of them being dispersed by agencies, about half known and unknown gotaways. And just to give you a sense of that, only nine states have populations less than 1.2 million people. So again, until we get that back under control, we're not going to be able to solve the DACA issue. We're not going to be able to stand up a functioning legal immigration system, which, by the way, I was working very closely with the Trump administration on their idea. It's going to shrink. We got like 100 different visas. It's going to collapse that down to about six and then have a, a merit type of system. Uh, with Again, you could also bring in limited family members. Uh, so I think it was very open from that standpoint, but really tied to our economy. And that's what we need to do. So I recognize the problem. I uh, was working with the Trump administration. I think if he would have been reelected, we'd probably be working on that legislation right now as opposed to having turned back the clock in terms of how long, again, it's going to be difficult to put this genie back in the bottle and get us to that point where we have secure borders so that we can actually pass the laws to fix this. Because if we don't secure the border first, all we do in solving the other problems is just create greater incentives for more people to come into this country illegally. And when you take a look at the depredations, the human trafficking, the sex trafficking, uh, you don't want illegal immigration. You want it a legal system.
that's helpful to America. Illegal immigration hurts us. Okay, I see a yeah. question here. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone in this room recognizes we want legal immigration. We don't want all the negative things you just mentioned. But what is the plan to increase our workforce? There are employers here that can't grow and develop and can't meet the needs of our customer base, whether it's a hospitality business or a manufacturing business. And I think we're looking for some solid answers. Yeah. Well, okay, the, the solid answers is stop paying people not to work. We only have 518 people. Uh, uh, well, again, you, so you'll have to increase birth rates, I guess, in, in Sheboygan or do something to attract more people. But I'm, I'm, again, I can't specifically talk to your, your specific numbers here in Sheboygan, but you know, through the state and na nationally, uh, in order to grow the labor force, I mean, what are the components? Birth rates, immigration. Those are pretty much the, the two things we have going for us. And, and you can't force people to have more kids, so that's why you need a legal immigration system. But in the meantime, uh, th there was an article written by uh, Nicholas Everstadt, a demographer who works for uh, uh, American Enterprise Institute. Not a real good title, Our Miserable 21st Century. But in that, he documented that about 20% of working age males are permanently out of the workforce. You know, why? Because we make it, they, we make it possible for them to be out of the workforce. You know, and there, there's a host of things. I mean, I, I, I don't want to pick each individual one, but there are so many different uh, entitlement programs uh, that pay people not to work. One of them was Medicaid expansion, which allowed, you know, g gave access to some of these uh, working age men to access to opioids for free or for three bucks. And then they sell them on the open market. I did an investigatory uh, investigation to that, published a report. I got vilified in the press for speaking the truth. I mean, we literally are incentivizing people not to work. Then we give them access to opioids that they use some of them, I suppose, but then they sell others for thousands of dollars to, to uh, supplant their income. There, there's just you know, one of those nasty realities of how the federal government exacerbates problems instead of solving them. So when you've got 20% of the working age male workforce permanently out of the workforce, how do you get them back? Well, qu quit making it possible for them to not work. Uh, again, that's, there, again, there are many components to that, but that's certainly one of them. Uh, another thing that is going to be crushing to our economies is the vaccine mandates. I mean, that is going to be so destructive, so disruptive to our economy, and yet the Biden administration, they are just plowing forward with it. But again, I, I'm happy to talk about COVID vaccines, all that kind of stuff, but let's just focus on the mandates right now. They are pointless. I don't care where you stand in terms of vaccines or their effectiveness. Or, I, I, I just held an event on the vaccine mandates and, and the vaccine injuries, which are real. And one of the participants, one of the experts, had a, a two-box decision tree. The top box said, are the COVID-19 vaccines effective? And then the yes line came down to the second decision box and said, well, if they're effective, then the vaccine mandates are pointless, right? Because if, if the vaccines are that effective, if you get a vaccine, what, what do you care whether somebody else gets or not? I mean, it should be a personal choice. No, nobody should be pressured, coerced, or fear reprisal for not refusing any medical treatment, including the COVID vaccine. I mean, I believe in freedom. But then if you follow the no line down, you know, the, the vaccines are not effective, it goes right to the same box. The vaccines are pointless. And unfortunately, we're on the no line right now because the vaccines are not as effective or as safe as we all hoped and prayed they would be. We now know, the science tells us, even if you're fully vaccinated, you can get seriously ill, you can die, you can get infected, you can transmit. So what is the point of the mandates? Why, why, are, we, why are we inflicting this wound on us? On our, it makes no sense. So right now I'm hoping and praying that uh, Rick Essenberg's and, and the other uh, state attorney generals, their lawsuits in joining this will be, will be successful, uh, particularly in healthcare. I just, got a, I just got a letter from a nurse, 35 years worth of experience. She quit. We just lost 35 years of experience in healthcare, and that's going to happen across the board because these heroes of, the, of COVID, the nurses and doctors actually had the courage and compassion to treat COVID patients. Many of them got infected with COVID. Some tragically died, most survived. 
They have natural immunity. They can read the science. They realize natural immunity is probably better, longer lasting than the vaccinated, as, we, as we're watching the vaccine effect in this way. They're now seeing and treating vaccine injured individuals as well. They are not gonna get vaccinated. They will either be terminated or they'll resign like this nurse did. And we will lose decades of experience. Just talk to a, a nurse who worked in a the hospital. They don't have any permanent nursing staff anymore. It's all traveling nurses. They're all getting texts saying, quit your job. You can make two, three, four times what you're making now as a traveling nurse. Again, we're going to lose decades of experience in specialties. This is disastrous. And yet, like I said, the Biden administration is plowing, plowing forward with it. It's very unfortunate. Um, on the topic of vaccine mandates, we actually had a couple of questions submitted along those lines. And uh, both of them basically come down to the question of do we think this is going to end up in the Supreme Court? Is that where this mandate is going to have to be evaluated? And if it does end up in the courts, um, what do you think is going to be the result? Are these uh, OSHA mandates and other mandates on employers to impose vaccines on their employees going to be enforceable? So again, we know that uh, state's attorney generals are suing. We know that Rick Essenberg with the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty is representing a couple employers suing the Seventh Circuit. Uh, the Seventh Circuit required, I just heard on, on the radio, uh, the government's response by the 12th of November. So this is going to be decided hopefully quickly. Hopefully they will enjoin this and this will end the mandates. Um, if we can end the mandates now, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, now that the, the COVID gods are finally recognizing, hey, you know what, it'd be a good idea if we had a pill for early treatment. You know, they've ignored the other ones that are working, by the way. Okay, I'm talking to doctors, I'm talking to patients, this multi-drug protocol for early treatment does work, but you know, it's not blessed by the COVID gods in our health agencies, but they are, it sounds like they're blessed one by Merck, maybe one by Pfizer, which they'll be a whole lot more expensive than generic drugs, but God, if they work, great. You know, if we've got early treatment, you won't need the vaccines. And by the way, this is what we should have done from the start. I've been pushing, I've been advocating for early treatment literally since March of 2020. It just is so frustrating. I, I can't explain why we have completely ignored and in many cases sabotaged the use of drugs that have been widely available for decades, billions of doses. And, and I have to tell you the safety difference, okay? Ivermectin, I'll say the word, Ivermectin. Over t almost 26 years of safety data on the Thayer system. It's a drug, so it's FDA adverse event reporting system. Over 26 years, on average, 15 deaths a year are reported associated with ivermectin. 15, one five. I hydroxychloroquine, the other dirty word. Um, over 26 years, on average, 64 deaths per year. The normal flu vaccine, by the way, about 78 deaths per year. COVID vaccines, we'll get a new number today. As of last Friday, 17,610 deaths in 10 months. Remdesivir, the, 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 bless, the drug that's been blessed, no proof that it reduces death, maybe a couple days in the hospital. Everybody glommed on that one, $3,000 a treatment. Toxic to different organs of the body. Oftentimes patients can't even tolerate the treatment. 1,499 deaths. Total adverse events on, on uh, the COVID vaccines approaching 850,000. Now, there are two, there are two uh, complaints about the VAER system. It doesn't prove causation, I understand that, but it also dramatically understates the adverse events. But of those 17,600 deaths, now those are worldwide, over 5,500 occurred on day zero, one, or two following vaccination. Again, doesn't prove causation, certainly causes me concern. I don't know why it doesn't concern Fauci and Collins and Walensky and Janet Woodcock. I have no idea why our COVID gods aren't looking at that. And I have no idea why they have this tremendous push for a vaccine in every arm. And I have to talk as well as talking about this vaccinating five to 11 year olds. Well, I'm connected to a global network of eminently qualified doctors and medical researchers. Okay, so I read all kinds of stuff. But I thought one of the interesting uh, comments was the fact that what Pfizer proved in its application to vaccinate five to 11 year olds is that their vaccine reduces the mortality rate 
of 5 to 11 years from virtually zero to virtually zero. Anybody that tells you that we know the long-term safety implications of these vaccines is bald-faced lying to you. Nobody knows. Nobody knows because we haven't taken the time. This is completely experimental. We've never had an mRNA vaccine ever used. Uh, it's producing a spike protein that we now know is toxic to the body. That's part, part of the problem with COVID is the spike protein is one of the problems with, and so we're having the body manufacture its own toxin. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical researcher, but I'm just telling you what is in the science. So it's not an irrational decision to say, you know, I think I'll kind of wait. I'll take my chances. I'm young, I'm healthy. Uh, deaths of COVID is really slanted toward the elderly and people with comorbidities. If you're young and healthy, I mean, I had COVID, it's completely asymptomatic, as are about 40 to 50% of everybody that gets COVID. So it's not an irrational decision to say, I'll put my, my fate in the hands of God. If I get COVID, I've got a really good chance of surviving it, hardly, sometimes with hardly any symptoms, versus I don't think I'll inject this experimental vaccine in my body yet. I'll give it a little time. Let, let's, let's see what else we find out about these things, particularly when you're me and I'm talking to and I'm meeting with the people that have severe vaccine injuries, as I just met with a group of them again in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. If you, by the way, if you haven't seen that, go, go to Rumble and, take a, and, and look at, at that meeting. L listen to their stories. Listen to Ernest, the father who lost his best friend, his 16-year-old son. Perfectly healthy, boom, vaccine, he's dead. You know, listen to those stories, and then try not to be critical of people that are trying to make their own decision. Very tough decisions, by the way. I, I don't encourage, I don't discourage. That's a personal choice. I'm the champion of right to try, but I'm also a champion of, of right to refuse. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Hi, my name is Ruth. Um, this is our little table of nurses here. Thank you very much, uh, first and foremost, for doing your due diligence and speaking for um, so many who have had adverse effects. We all know that it hasn't been coming to light as we would have liked. Um, I think a lot more lives could have been saved had this uh, been brought to the table earlier. Um, I guess my question is in regards to um, what you foresee happening to uh, nurses such as myself who have already lost their jobs, uh, what the recourse would be um, in regards to getting us back into the workforce. My guess and my hope is they will be begging you to come back in the workforce. They should. Um, no, this, this, this is a tragedy what's happening right now. You know, doctors, nurses who have devoted their lives to saving other lives, again, they, they were, the, you are the heroes of COVID. Now you're just being cast aside. Again, for no reason. I mean, I, I mean, I, I honestly could understand. I, I would understand and, and might actually support it if the vaccines were incredibly safe and incredibly effective, but they're not. So what's the point? You're particularly on the effective, effectiveness uh, measurement. If, if you can still get infected, you can still transmit, why segregate our society? Why do this to ourselves? I, I don't get it. I do not get it. You know, why, why push, push this on children that have like a, a near zero chance of serious COVID or certainly death from COVID? You know, 1.8 million Swedish school children went to school, no masks, nothing, okay? Not one died. And it's, it's, I guess it's pretty hard to find, I, again, I haven't done the full research on this, but I've heard other people say that the children in America that died it's hard to find anybody that didn't have some, you know, several comorbidities. And that, I mean, that happens with seasonal flu. I mean, your greater chance, what we've seen is greater chance of dying from seasonal flu than COVID if you're very young. So again, it, it just makes no sense. But thank you for being a nurse, by the way. Um, you expressed that you are a fan of personal choice in the area of vaccines, and you expressed that uh, there shouldn't be a federal mandate, I believe, uh, for vaccines. Do you think there should be federal law prohibiting employers from requiring vaccines? 
Um, first of all, the courts are, are really pretty supportive of employer mandates. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. I mean, you're an employer, you're a private sector, uh, you own a business, you can set the terms and conditions of your employment, okay? I think what I would support uh, would be a cause of action against an employer that puts somebody in, that, in a coercive position to get some kind of treatment, uh, and if they don't get it, they lose their job. So, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, you're, you're forcing somebody to make a decision under such duress. And if that individual under duress decides to take that vaccine and then gets injured, I think they ought to have a cause of action against that employer. I think that'd be the best way to handle it. Then I, then I think employers would, would themselves take a look at the safety and they go, well, I have no problem in you guys taking ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, you know, just holding off and, you know, I'll do everything I can to facilitate early treatment. Uh, but I'm not going to mandate this vaccine because I've seen 17,600 people have died on the VAER system. Uh, I've seen people being paralyzed. Uh, I don't think I'm going to take that risk as an employer to force that on you because I could get sued. I think that'd be a better, better solution as opposed to outlawing mandates. Um, going back to uh, the 1.2 million illegals that you uh, referred to earlier, um, and a lot of them being flown on the earliest flight possible to different locations in the United States. Are you aware of anything proposed in the reconciliation bill that would give them uh, the right to vote before the next election? And if so, have you noticed a trend on where they're going and if they are primarily uh, blue states where these uh, illegals are fronting trend? Well, they should not have the right to vote. I don't, I don't see, I, ha I haven't heard they're trying to do that in reconciliation, they're trying to do some other things in terms of nationalizing elections, which I'm utterly opposed to. You know what? One of the things that gives us a great deal of security in our elections is the fact they're managed by 50 individual states, and even within states, managed by different municipalities. Uh, if, if every if every election clerk, and I think the vast majority of them in Wisconsin are like my election clerk uh, in in the town of Oshkosh, I, I've, I've got a great deal of confidence in our elections. But the problem is you've got some of these jurisdictions that they're not very transparent. It just makes people suspicious, and that's unfortunate. Uh, so, no, I mean, they should not be able to vote. I, I am concerned about the you know, relaxation of all these standards, all these controls. Um, I think our goal should be to restore confidence in the integrity of our election system for everybody. I mean, Democrat and Republican, no matter who wins, Democrat or Republican, this is unsustainable state of affairs where you know, 2016, half the country didn't think uh, Donald Trump was a legitimate president. 2020, now half don't think Joe Biden. Um, that's unsustainable. Uh, and particularly when you recognize that it was the, a bipartisan Baker Carter, you know, James Baker, Jimmy Carter, their commission on election integrity, uh, when they point out the fact that absentee ballot really, ballots really represent the greatest risk to fraud, and what do we do during COVID? We doubled the number of absentee ballots while at the same time relaxing all the controls, and we and relaxed the controls here in Wisconsin on steroids, completely issuing guidances out of WEC contrary to state law. That's got to be tightened up. You know, WEC's got to be reined in. The legislature has to reassert its authority over federal elections, and I think they can unilaterally. I, I don't. You look at the Constitution, no mention of a governor. So that would be my advice to the state legislature. Reassert your authority on federal elections, and you really can't have two sets of elections. So do it that, and those same types of rules should govern uh, state elections as well. But they need, they need to act. They need to act in a very public way so that people understand why we're doing this. You know, the, the, the potential, you know, I want to make sure every legitimate vote counts. I, want to, I do want to make it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. Seems like the other side tends to want to make it kind of easy to cheat. Uh, I don't think most Americans like that. I mean, I, I think the political class was shocked at a poll that said 80% 80, 80 of Americans support voter ID. I think, the public's, I think the public's on the side of election controls and election integrity. So that's, that's the direction we ought to move, okay? <laughs> yep. I think something that would affect election integrity for me would be 
finance, campaign finance change. I think, like you, I believe every person who's legally supposed to vote is entitled to one vote. That doesn't mean that I, through any organization that I belong to, should donate millions of dollars to affect the election for somebody in Idaho or Timbuktu or wherever. That's just wrong. I should be able to affect the elections here and in national elections, I should have one vote. This, I mean, the teachers union, and I'm not picking on them, it could be any, can literally buy elections. That just negates my vote and all the other individuals who think they're expressing one vote. I don't care what the limit is, but there should be a limit and you, on what someone can accept as campaign co uh, contributions for an individual uh, position and it should come from individuals only and it should have to be disclosed. So uh, where, where I completely agree with you is disclosure. I think that is the overall solution. Uh, you know, the, the McCain-Feingold campaign finance has been it's just been a miserable failure. I mean, all that's done is, is redirected campaign contributions from the accountable campaigns where contributions are controlled and into, you know, the PACs. And, you know, th th that's, from my standpoint, out of control. You know, one, one of the reasons, truthfully, that I just haven't uh, decided or even announced a decision is these campaigns are way too long. They cost way too much money. Because I, I keep saying I'm doing everybody a favor, not announcing. I mean, I think they've already spent a couple million dollars against somebody who hasn't even announced for a candidacy with negative campaign ads. So from my standpoint, it's, you, you need to bring the donations back into the campaign. I think where I may be apart from you a little bit is I do believe dollars equals free speech. Uh, I mean, free speech, yeah, you can go stand on, on a corner on a soapbox and scream, but nobody's going to hear you. So you do need to pay to have your speech heard. And it's not an even playing field. When you've got one political party that has, you know, supportive unions that have people that can just donate time and, and they make it so, you know, they're being paid to donate time. And it's, it's an unlevel playing field. So there's got to be some way to make it a, a, a more fair playing field. But when you've got complete disclosure, you know, now you've got accountability. I mean, if, if some, if some multi-billionaire gives somebody a couple million bucks, well, people know that. Um, as a candidate, I'm not sure you'd want to necessarily accept that because, oh, you, you've been bought and paid for by this particular person. So to me, the real solution on campaign finances isn't to violate free speech rights, not to restrict speech, but just have full disclosure so people know what's pulling off. Okay, I second that motion. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but can I just, an addendum to that though? Uh, there is a, this was decided in, in NAACP versus Alabama, I think in the 50s. I also want to make sure that donors are protected when they're giving to political causes. Because other, otherwise, that can also be a chilling impact if, if, you know, that money can be disclosed. So I'm, I'm talking about disclosure for candidates for office, but I think people that support a cause, whether it's Sierra Club, whether it's NAACP, whether it's, you know, a conservative cause or whatever. I think donors ought to be able to donate that confidentially and not have their names exposed because there's been an awful lot of intimidation and threats. And that's why the courts decided, I think, 9-0 in the NAACP through Alabama. Alabama was trying to get NAACP to reveal its donor list, and the Supreme Court said no. I, I hear your point, and I don't disagree with it, but then... Um wouldn't George Soros be very good at trying to hide himself in some organization? He'll, he'll, he'll always be really good. I mean, there's just some things you can't fix, okay? Again, there is, you know, with, with freedom comes responsibility, but I suppose also a little bit of risk. I mean, life's not perfect. But over, over here? On the some elections, um, the forensic audit in Maricopa County uncovered a bunch of voting irregularities. We got subpoenas in Georgia, subpoenas in Pennsylvania. We got Gableman investigation in Wisconsin. Do you see anything, in your opinion, coming out of this, or is it just a waste of time and money? Well, first of all, I think a lot has already come out. Um, I mean, you had the lawsuit, which revealed, you know, all kinds of uh, problems with WEC issuing guidances and election clerks, you know, initiating procedures that were contrary to, to law. I mean, the ability to cure ballots, balloting in the park. I mean, so. So we already knew kind of the universe of, of the votes that 
know, you, I think it's fair to say we're illegally cast, but it's not like the, necessarily that the voters did something illegal. It was just it, the process was violated. And that, that you know, makes possible uh, a greater, you know, potential fraud. Uh, but you know, let's, let's say you're a voter, voter in the park. It's not exactly like your vote was nefariously cast. So you didn't know any better. I mean, this is what the clerk said. Or, or if your ballot was cured by an election clerk, that's not really the voter's fault. So I mean, that's part, part of the issue in terms of, you know, what the courts had to decide with those violations of Wisconsin laws. The, the remedy looked pretty unappealing. And we've actually done that in the past. I can't remember the exact law, but I think there was one uh, smaller race where, like, 500 ballots, there, there, you know, it was determined that 500 votes were cast illegally in some way, shape, or form. So they literally just took 500 votes, votes and threw them away. I mean, the number of votes we were talking about in Wisconsin because of these uh, guidances contrary to, to, to uh, state law, we literally would have taken like a couple hundred thousand and tossed them. Um, you know, I, I can kind of understand why courts sort of shied away from that particular remedy and kind of looked to remedying this in the future. So uh, I do know that there, you know, there's a bunch of people, and that's a good thing. I mean, not only state legislators, but I know there's also uh, individuals that have, you know, bought and paid for the uh, election files, and they're they're you know getting a, a company that can go th sort through the data to uh, examine irregularities. Like you know, a lot of people living as you know registered a single family house. You know, some of that can be explained. You know, you might have a house that's being rented all the time, and literally over however long those files go back, you might have a bunch of people having been registered to that house but are inactive. So. Again, I just think all of these irregularities need to be fully examined and explained. And where there's Ill Ill illegality, we need to prosecute people. P people can't get away scot-free or else fraud just continues. But I think we also have to be you know, very honest and upfront where you know, there are things that maybe look suspicious and go, okay, well, that's been explained, so set that off the side. But you know, from my standpoint, we should leave no stone unturned. Uh, I'm guessing no stone will be unturned. It takes time. It's, 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 you know, one of the reasons fraud probably just continues is it's really hard to detect it. It's really hard because once that ballot's in the pile, what is there to prove? I mean, so we can prove that ballots were cured contrary to state law. But was that the voters' fault? Is that WEC's fault? I mean, you know, I, I would say that's WEC's fault. They, they allowed it to happen. They encouraged it to happen. That, that's why, again, I think the state legislature should disavow WEC so you're, you're, we're not, election clerks, don't follow them. We are, we are reasserting our constitutional authority to set the times, place, and manner of elections. And then I think they should be passing laws as well. But you know, first, first, follow the law. You know, get rid of these guidance that are contrary to law. We, we have the, the Legislative Audit Bureau that kind of lays it all out. They've got all kinds of recommendations. So again, there's been, a, there's been a pretty orderly process here in Wisconsin examining this stuff. I believe that process will, go, will continue. I think. Uh, Justice Gableman, I think he'll come out with a, a preliminary report, and that's all that is. He'll highlight areas, and then I think, you know, you say forensic audit. Um, what is, you know, I'm not being critical of you, but what is that? I mean, no, all, all forensic audit means is it's an audit that's designed to detect fraud. My guess is, you know, rather than some just massive thing that's going to uncover everything, you know, we kind of have the universe of where the problems are. So now you start forensically auditing each one of these issues. Uh, leave no stone unturned, and again, what we can explain, say, okay, we thought this was a problem, but it wasn't. You know, it looked, it looked pretty fraudulent, but it wasn't. Or, oh, this was fraudulent. Or this is a real serious lapse in control that we got to tighten up. So again, we just have to be honest. We have to go through the process, uh, and it just takes time. And, you know, if, and if you're really going to get down to the fraud level, it literally is, look at the voter file and say, okay, this person who hadn't voted for the 30 last elections all of a sudden voted. And then you have to go and see whether that person actually voted or whether that ballot was fraudulently cast in some way, shape, or form. It's just, it's just incredibly, incredible, meticulous work. And generally, nobody has the time or money or effort or, or willpower to do it. I, I don't think we can afford not to have the the willpower to do this. It's, it's so crucial that we restore confidence in our election system. Okay? Does that hopefully answer your question? Anybody else? Another Sir. 
you want to you want to <coughs> just share your perspective on the Virginia election and uh, you know how that might uh, you know change the you know kind of the partisan nature uh, you know kind of going forward maybe provide us with some hope. Yeah. Like, again, I don't think you put too much stock in any one particular election. I mean, I think Virginia, a, I think the moment was just literally one comment by Terry McAuliffe that said, you know, parents shouldn't have any, any say in what we teach their kids. I mean, I think that is just, that was so jaw-droppingly arrogant. And particularly in light of the fact that, you know, Virginians were already rising up and, you know, resisting critical race theory and, uh, you know. Uh, so that cost them the race. Now, even before that, though, it was a dead even race. And I think that really speaks to more of the national trend where I'm, I'm hoping this is the case that as Mark Levin calls for in his book, uh, American Marxism, Americans must awaken to the urgency of the moment. And I think Joe Biden was, was granted the nomination by the media. Okay, they weren't, they weren't, gonna, gonna, weren't gonna nominate a radical because that would scare Americans and you couldn't, beat uh, Trump. So they, they crowned Joe Biden, the, the, the moderate in that race, let him campaign out of the basement. And I think Americans have been shocked that Joe Biden is not governed as a moderate at all. I mean, his policies are radical. I mean, I don't know how else to, I mean, opening up the borders, I mean, the, the, the jaw, I mean, it, it was bad enough. I mean, I, I voted for, I think, one of those, one big COVID package, and that was it. That was more than enough. When we started, by the way, when we started negotiating the CARES package, it was $750 billion. And I knew we had to do something fast and massive to give confidence in the financial markets. We weren't going to let them collapse. I thought $750 was more than enough. Then literally a week, it was $2.2 trillion, which just shows you the problem with the federal government. Okay? They love to spend money. But then they kept spending money. Um, so... Biden comes into office, and, and you know, even though we got a trillion dollars left from the first four trillion, another one point nine trillion, boom, just like that. You know, Bernie's out there wanting to spend six trillion dollars, and they'll still spend basically six trillion. The package will be six trillion. They'll just score it at one point seven trillion by not being honest. It's, it's say, oh, this this entitled prog program will actually end in six months. No, it won't. I mean, once you grant a new entitlement, it's almost impossible to do away with them. So. Uh, I think Americans are shocked at what Democrat governance looks like. I mean, at least I hope they are shocked. So that's, that's kind of my comment on that. Uh, my guess is the Democrats are going to keep doubling down on it. I don't, I don't think they're going to get the message, I think. Again, again, you look at McAuliffe, I mean, just the arrogance of that statement. You know. Anybody else? Yep. Do you have any comments on our Attorney General? On Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, yeah, he's a disgrace. I, I, you know, I, full disclosure, I voted for confirmation. I, I really, my attitude has always been elections matter. I think there's, we really have way too many confirmations. I, I think a president ought to be able to staff his administration. But, you know, we should have confirmation votes on the, the key cabinet officers, you know, maybe 100, you know, no, we've got over 1,000. Confirmation. So no, no president's ever able to staff his administration because you just don't have enough time going through the confirmations, not in today's divisive Senate, where you, everybody makes the other side, always makes the other side run the clock. Uh, I've, I've really started voting no on most because, I mean, he, he is just nominating radical after radical, and I just don't want my fingerprints on any of the Biden administration policies. Uh, Merrick Gar Garland is, is a real regret, as is Anthony Blinken. Uh, but again, I, I, I voted for him because I think the president should have advisors that agrees with him, not necessarily me. But Merrick Garland, I think, has violated his oath of office. Uh, the intimidation, I mean, that was grotesque. And then, then you find out the details of it. This is a letter written by the Association of School Boards, National, Associ National School Board Association, to the Biden administration. It was a phone call made by, you know, Either Biden or his handlers to Merrick Garland is you're going to you know you're going to write an intimidation letter to, to uh, parents. Um, I think it's outrageous, and I think the I think the the treatment of the people who've been arrested for January 6th is pretty outrageous as well. Now again, I condemned, and again the press doesn't report this honestly. I immediately condemned 
the violence when I was able to finally see it. Um, but it's also true, there were not thousands of armed insurrectionists. That was a completely false narrative. It's a narrative designed to allow Merrick Garland to pretty well name tens of millions of Americans as suspected domestic terrorists to write that intimidation letter. That is why that, and by the way, the reason that narrative was kind of supported is that those members of Congress, the leaders that were responsible for, for capital security, I mean, if there were thousands of armed insurrections, they, I mean, how could they plan for this? I mean, there was, there, were, there was no security plan. The breach never should have happened. It, a minimal contingent, you know, with those, what they call them, the, the bicycle fences. You know, you would have had a, if you would have had a police presence there, you never would have got that surge. And by the way, I, I, I was just, I've seen the video. It was, it was my oversight letter that revealed that over 300 people just walked in one door. There was no, I mean, they just walked in the West Terrace door. Uh, and I've, I've been listening to more and more interviews of, of people that never went in the Capitol, but they just happened to be in Washington, D.C. You basically get SWAT teams you know, arresting them. I mean, that, that, is, that is a violation of people's rights. I mean, these aren't, listen, you do that when you've got drug dealers with automatic weapons. I mean, that, that's when you use those police tactics. You don't do that to basically law-abiding citizens that just happen to show up in Washington, D.C. to exercise their First Amendment rights to peacefully assemble and, and petition the government. And that's what we're doing. And I, I see the judge, I think, is, is clearing out uh, the D.C. jail. It's just such an awful place. Um, so, no, I'm, I, I'm not happy with Merrick Garland. I mean, good thing he's not a Supreme Court justice. Anybody else? Again, I'm, I'm not the most uplifting character, sorry. <laughs> All right, another, oh. um, can you tell us what's happening with the Americans, that there are still some in Iraq and people that we promised to bring over who have been our supporters over there? You, you, you mean in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan. No, so I, I do I do know the administration is I know they're negotiating with the Taliban. You know I, I don't know what price will be paid. Uh, you know my guess the Taliban is definitely using American citizens as as negotiating pawns. You know I know there are uh, outside groups uh, that are trying to get people out. Now I also know there are American citizens that again they also are they may be dual citizens of Afghanistan or they've got you know Afghan uh, family members and they don't want to leave. So uh, I, I think more important, what, what I am more concerned about is getting the truth out of who all we evacuated and who all we let in this country. It, it, it wasn't a bunch of special immigrants visa holders that, that worked for U.S. government. It, it literally was uh, we evacuated individuals that were able to get into Kabul air, uh, airport in the chaos of the moment. We didn't know who they were. We still don't know who they are. We are creating identities for them, and we're just we're just creating identities. So now, now all of a sudden, they all have access to well, they already have access to uh, parolee status, which is, is not a term, but that gives you legal rights in America. They go through the State Department uh, refugee program; they'll be eligible for other immigration rights. Uh, and again, my guess is most people that crowded into Kabul airport. Uh, didn't want to be governed by the Taliban. I think we kind of share that. Uh, my guess is there aren't that many that are security threat, but my, my guess is also that this administration is doing a terrible job of positively, positively vetting everybody. When they say everybody's been screened, all that means is they're taking either biometric fingerprints or biographical information, comparing it against a derogatory data, you know, like a terrorist watch list. We have a bunch of these lists. And if you didn't show up on that, you're home free. They're, they're really not. They're really not doing interviews. Uh, you know, they, they. So the people in the states saying, well, they interview that in the lily pad countries. You go talk to the people in the lily pad countries, and well, we're not interviewing. We're expecting you guys to interview them. So, it's it's a mess. Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm just hoping and praying that uh, uh, ISIS terrorists or Al Qaeda terrorists didn't slip through that and are, and and might be plotting a. You know, I hope that's not going to be the case. But uh, this, I mean, incompetence doesn't even begin to. Uh, underscore what, how, how President Biden handled handle Afghanistan. We, we never, sh we never should have totally abandoned it. We should have maintained 
a very strategic Bagram Air Force Base, a couple hundred or a couple thousand uh, special op troops uh, would have allowed our NATO partners to stay. We could have supported the Afghan security forces. Uh, we could have kept the Taliban at bay. By the way, it's the, Af the Afghans have been fighting and dying. More, more than 60,000 have died to defend their freedom, and now that's all lost. I mean, it's, it's just a travesty. And it's dangerous. So it's an embarrassing but also dangerous surrender. That's uplifting. One of the questions that we got uh, ahead of time has to do with um, federal support for economic development here. And uh, specifically, do you believe the federal government should support additional spending on infrastructure to support businesses? If so, what type of uh, support would you need? So my position on infrastructure at this moment uh, would be the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package that was passed on purely, purely party lines. Again, when we had more than a trillion dollars of the four trillion, that hadn't been spent yet. Uh, 700 billion of that 1.9 trillion wasn't even scheduled to be spent till 2022 through I think 2028. Clearly not COVID relief. I mean, it's just setting up new programs. And so my position, I wish this would have been a uh, Republican position that we would have stayed pat on is, uh, so we don't further mortgage our kids' future. I mean, that was already passed, you know, the bonds are gonna have to be bought. Let's take that $700 billion, rescind it and repurpose it for infrastructure. About 700 billion would have been more than enough. But in any infrastructure package, which drives me nuts is, you know, how's it spent? I, I always ask, hey, give me the list. You know, what, what are you gonna spend this on? But you know, we, we end up just allocating it to, and it just gets misspent all, all, all over the place. I mean, I, I know the, uh, you know, what the American, cover, what is it, ARPA? I mean, listen, I know municipalities just love free money. Uh, I know a lot of municipalities are going, I don't know what we're going to spend this on. Uh, the good news, by the way, those ARPA funds, I know the state can't decrease taxes, but municipal governments can. So, I mean, I'll, good luck you know, securing those, you know, with whatever strings are attached, but... Uh, uh, I, I would have preferred taking the $700 billion and repurposing that, but give us a good list of what we need to spend money on. And specifically, what types of things do you think we should be spending money on? Well, from the federal government, you can, again, can always argue who should pay for what. Uh, you know, local needs should be as much as possible supported by, by local governments, but you know, things like interstate highways, locks and dams, you know, th things that really contribute to interstate uh, commerce, uh, that type of thing. That's that would be the first priority for federal spending. You know, again, I'm not opposed the way we've turned government on its head, where you know the the federal government sucks up most of the cash to allocate some of that as well. And by the way, I'm not when it comes to deficit spending, infrastructure is one thing. I'm not opposed to borrowing money to pay for infrastructure, but at this point in time, when we're you know. $29 trillion in debt and, and running at least just operational deficits of a trillion dollars a year. Uh, a little reluctant to do that right now, but in normal times. I mean, if you, if you were not running deficits at all, I would have no problem. I would support you know, borrowing money to pay for infrastructure the last 20, 30 years. I mean, that's what you do in mortgages. It makes perfect sense. But again, in, in today's world with uh, all the deficits spending, all the money chasing too few goods, uh, I think we're in stagflation. Uh, this is not the time to keep loading onto that that debt. That's what we're doing right now. Related question someone else asked has to do with transportation. And is there any particular investment we should be making in transportation? You mentioned a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, truck drivers and airline pilots. I'm dead serious about that. We've got a real, real shortage, and it's going to continue. But part of the issue, and again, I, I would refer you to my Wall Street Journal op-ed that ran on, on uh, I think it's Monday or Tuesday. Um, but, I, but I'm talking about how harmful it's been to our society, this multi-decade narrative to our, all of our kids, you gotta get a four-year degree. I mean, that's, that's fine for people that have the aptitude that know what they wanna do with a four-year degree. But what does that tell a kid when you just push on everybody? What does that tell a kid who doesn't wanna to go to college? That wants to go into trades, do something else, you know, wants to work in you know, valuable work in, in factories, you know, like I said, fields and factories. What, that they're second-class citizens, that their work doesn't have value? The, the, the result of that right now is we can't fill those positions. Got a bunch of kids collectively $1.7 trillion in debt. $1.7 trillion in debt. 
I can't tell you how many how heartbreaking it is when I get a, a parent sometimes hand me an envelope. Hey, Sandra, can you do something? And I open it up and I read how you know this this parent's child and and you know maybe their spouse is in two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, been making payments ten years, haven't take paid off any principal. We, we've enticed our children to dig themselves a hole they can never dig themselves out of. They're delaying buying a house or delaying having a family. They're, they're delaying starting a life when the whole purpose of college was to make a beautiful life for them. But you don't hear many people talking about that, do you? It's like, oh, everything's coming up roses. This has been great. You know, look at her, you know. No, it's, in many respects, it's been a disaster. So, you know, my suggestion is let's start valuing all work. And my parents brought me up basically believing that the greatest compliment you could ever pay somebody else is there's a really hard worker, no matter what they did. Now, the good news is these shortages is people in those trades are going to, they're going to start getting paid what they're worth. The, the price of plumbing, electric, electrical, truck driving, you know, the price of that stuff's going to go up, and it probably should. These are, these are valuable workers. These are valuable trades. But you know, let's let's stop forcing our kids into college, uh, forcing them into debt, getting degrees that nobody values, and you know, fill in the blank studies courses. I mean, okay, there's some value in I guess learning how to think. Um, I, I'd rather, much rather have them learn how to live. And you know, after a couple of years out of high school, they're working stuff. They say, hey, you know, I really would like to improve my education. Then go to college. Yeah, I just we just do this totally backwards. Um, it's unfortunate. Well, the big question that uh, people want to know the answer to, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, but are you running for re-election? So, so I, I, I honestly have not made that decision. Uh, but I will say I'm kind of stepping up the pace of the people I need to talk to, uh, consider all the factors. So I, I have made the comment that the decision will not be in the distant future. So that's as much as you can get out of me. <laughs> I, I am mindful, and it is impactful, quite honestly, uh, as I've traveled around the state, how many people, you know, are encouraging me to, you know, strongly encouraging me. So I've, I've only had one person come up and say, hey, remember you pledged. So, but by the way, when I made that pledge, I mean, you know, me and my wife meant it. Um, I would be happy to return to my former life. I really would be. Um, but in 2010, I ran because I was panicked for our nation. Here it is 2021, I'm more panicked. I don't know about you guys, but I'm more panicked. And that, that will be a big factor. You need to run. <laughs> there you go, I told you that has an impact. <laughs> yep. I'm not trying to be funny saying this, I'm serious. Um, talking about work, we have a vice president. Uh, Vice President Pence was pretty visible. We saw him a lot, he did a lot of things. Can you tell us anything that our current Vice President does even wrong? Well, she's not a very good border czar. Uh, when she went down to Central America in search of the root cause, I, mean, I suggest, well, just walk into the Oval Office. You'll, you'll see the, run, the, the root cause of the border crisis sitting behind the whichever desk he's uh, chosen to, to use. Um, yeah, uh, beyond that, I mean, Kamala, what I will say about uh, Vice President Harris is she served on my committee when I was chairman. And I'm not sure she was there for the entire time my chairmanship. I don't think she was, but she was there for multiple hearings on the border and our illegal immigration system. So we held hearings where, you know, testimony was provided that they were selling children. One child sold for $81 to be used for an adult as a family member. You know, that, that, that turned into a family so that you can't separate them, you're home free, you get in. A little three-year-old boy was abandoned in a, in a 100 degree heat in a cornfield because the adult that he was either sold to or used him got in, didn't need the kid anymore. She's aware of the sex trafficking. She had to be aware, you know, I went to Guatemala one time, I, 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 uh, I visited a, a shelter for sex trafficked little girls. I mean, 11 year olds. I mean, the oldest one was something like 16. And they had a bunch of little cribs, obviously, because 
have a lot of babies. So the vice president's fully aware of that. The president should be, and yet they're enacting these policies that facilitate the multi-billion dollar business model of the human traffickers, of the sex traffickers, of the drug traffickers. So I can tell you that about the vice president and the president. They're aware of what their policies are going to result in, and they press them forward anyway. They're, they have to be aware of what these mandates are going to do. They have to be aware of the gut-wrenching, life-altering decisions that people are going to have to make. They have to be aware of the depredations of the open border policy of the, of the human trafficking. They have to be aware of that. But they throw caution in the wind. I mean, quite honestly, they have to be aware of the vaccine injuries. It's their own VAER system. Let's get a shot in every arm. Hey, let's put them in kids. Why? I have no idea. I, have, I, can't, I can't explain a liberal mind. I can't. All I can do is try and warn Americans of the harm. And one of the things I've been criticized for, and it's just not true, most things I've been criticized about are not true. I mean, the lies and distortions of the media are profound. I hope you understand that. Um, but, you know, during the election, I would often be the, the pre-rally speaker. And you know, I, I, one of my standard lines was, uh, when we listened to President Obama, five days before he got elected, he said, you're going to fundamentally transform this country. And then Joe Biden parroted the exact same phrase. We're going to fundamentally transform America. So I just asked the question, do you, do you like, much less love somebody you want to fundamentally transform? So I wake up in, you know, in the morning, I look over at my wife, Jane, and say, Jane, I love you. And I'm going to change everything about you. No. Now, I get accused of saying Democrats don't love this country. That's not what I'm saying. It's quoting the poll. What I was trying to warn Americans about, Wisconsinites about, is don't elect leaders that don't think America's a particularly good place, that think we're a systemically racist nation, that, that think we have to fundamentally change what we are and who we are, with things like critical race theory. So, we ha again, we have to awaken to what Democrat policies lead to. It's not good. This, is, this isn't, you know, I, I can almost understand during the Great Depression, you know, I can understand people going, there, there's got to be a better model than laissez-faire capitalism, you know, no holds barred, no, no rules, no regulations, you know, let's, and, you know, so they tried socialism, they tried communism. Tens of millions of people were murdered in those totalitarian regimes. So now it's not theory. We've, we've just seen the late, latest experience in Venezuela. An oil-rich nation. An economic basket case where the population is starving. I think 10 to 15% of the population is fled. It's because of socialism. That's what people that want to fundamentally, fundamentally transform America, that's the path they want to put America on. I'm panicked about that. I wish more Americans were. I, I, I certainly hope at least a majority are. Because I don't know about you, but I, I dearly love this country. I, I know it's not perfect, but it's the best thing that's ever happened in this world in terms of a government and an economy. Nothing has even come close other than the other nations that have now followed our example and delivered similar prosperity, but that's America that paved the way. That's our system. Yeah, there are things that need to be fixed, like out of control government spending. But most of the solutions lie here in chambers of commerces, in our cities, in our towns, in our municipalities, in our states, in our families. Again, renewed faith, stronger families, supportive communities. That's where the solutions are going to lie. So if you're dissatisfied with the way things are, don't look to the federal government to solve your problems. 
Take control here. Run for local office. Get, 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 get our own house in order here. And you just might have that trickle up effect as, as the nation looks at, oh, there's, there's a good, pretty good success story here. It's, perfect example is Joseph Project. Wasn't, that wasn't done for political reasons. It was just like, there's a need. There's a way of, of satisfying that need. And good people in Sheboygan, together with an extraordinary man, Pastor Jerome Smith, who's no longer with us, we provide an example of how you transform people's lives one person at a time. There's a solution. Just, you know, stop looking for the, again, trust me, the federal government is just not capable of doing these things. They, they, they screw it up. They exacerbate problems while they're mortgaging your kids' future. So on that happy note, <laughs> is that it? Or? That's it. We're okay. out of time. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.